Uh, hi, so my name is Anita Friel. I work with uh, Oxfam. I have been working in this uh, field for 15 years plus, so uh, it's amazing, you know, to hear uh, you two. I suppose if I, if I may, Roby, you know, the old guard that I put myself into and the new guard. And congratulations, you know, both of you, but in particular, Roby, again, you know, uh, uh, Sean, if you allow me, because I think we know as the old guard that if we moved as far as we have moved, I bet, I bet obviously, you know, it's not enough. It was, I personally believe that it was be, be, because of all of the advocacy and all this AIDS movement. And I think the concern was that, you know, where are the young people who have to take, you know, this stores now? So, I'm, you know, absolutely inspired to hear Robbie that, you know, that maybe, you know, the safe, you know, the, the AIDS move is in safe hands, you know, with Robbie. So, you know, thanks again very much for that. So this, uh, this was my comment. In terms of questions, maybe I'd like, you know, uh, to Sean one question, uh, or if you can comment in, on the, around young women, you know, I mean, we heard about the, 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 of course, you know, the key populations and the high-risk groups, you know, and so on, and the number of times, you know, if you like, if you like how, how more, uh, you know, infected, you know, they are at risk of getting and so on. But within those groups, I mean, the sex workers, you, you know, of course, it's young women, uh, the injecting drug dealers, yes, you have young women there, but also if you, if you think in terms of numbers overall, certainly the young women, you know, uh, nowadays would make a huge, you know, proportion. So I'd like to comment, you know, a little bit on that. How can we bring, you know, young women, if you like, in the HIV prevention and more investment, you know, could go towards that. And maybe for, for Robbie, uh, it struck me, you know, and I face this even when I do, you know, lecturing or talks or, you know, you name it around Ireland, that, the lack of sex education, you know, in schools and how patchy it is and how very much depending on the school. Uh, that's, I think that needs to be, you know, uh, raised and what, you know, again, what we can do about that because at 21, if you hadn't heard, I think, you know, about HIV, mm. it's possibly because it lacked, you know, somewhere in the, you know, school system. So, yeah. That's Great. It. Thank you. Thanks, Anita, very much. Um, we'll take a few rounds of questions and then we'll go back to Sean and, um, and to Robbie. Hello there, my name is Michal Roach. I work for a company called Trinity Biotech. Uh, we are the uh, manufacturer of uh, Unigold HIV wrappers. Um, just a bit of background before I come to my question. Uh, we are the second largest supplier of rapid HIV tests into Africa, Southeast Asia and Latin America and into the United States also. Um, Gentlemen, I would have to compliment you on your presentations. They were absolutely superb and inspiring. Um, I would be very interested to know what your view would be on the question that is being, or the issue that is being pushed by the NGOs at the moment to achieve their 99 to 90 program, and that is the question of self-testing. It's it's been in a place in the United States for many years and has had dubious uh, success. And it seems at the moment that the NGOs are pushing self-testing as a rapid way to achieve their goal while ignoring the, the downside of self-testing, such as lower sensitivity and specificity, and then, more importantly, the question of uh, counselling and, and support. I'm kind of lost, lost for words. The words TikTok, TikTok resonates with me. Um, and I'm thinking of when you were diagnosed when you were 21 years of age and when I probably got infected with HIV when I was 21 and 20, what, 25 years living with the medication and the side effects and all that. Um, and then I look at Robbie, and Robbie's the first time I've ever been in the same room as you. Um, I did hear you on uh, Pat Kenny one morning. And I Ryan Turberty. Sorry? Ryan Turberty. Oh, Ryan, actually. We yeah, got to mix the Ryan Turberty. Uh, get it right. Um, but I remember thinking, God, he sounds so normal. And I saw a photograph of you then, and... I thought, God, this guy looks so normal, and he talked about his mother. I'm dying to meet your mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, then, you're an example of how very normal so many young people throughout the world are when they become infected with HIV. You know, you're a real example. 
and I suppose to both you guys just to say thank you so much for your presentations tonight. To thank Father Michael as well, he really motivates everybody. And I remember in 2010, we were sharing a, a podium in Maynooth, we were walking through the snow, and I was behind Father Michael and um, I touched him on his shoulder and he said, James, stand away, I want to look at you. And he looked at me and then he embraced me. And I just thought, if we could just embrace people from all walks of life like that, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. In relation to the 1990 targets, you know, Nicola used the word, we have an aspiration to end AIDS. I'm going to say that this needs to be more than an aspiration. It needs to be a challenge. It needs to be a name. Robbie talked about we need to be cute around where we're spending our money. My euro, I'm very proud of my euro going to Irish aid because I think it's been spent well. But as a global community of donors, is that global community asking the same question? How is this going to address the 1990 targets? The global community needs to be doing that. And I would also argue um, that the global network of people with HIV and other networks of people with HIV need to be playing their part because I think it's quite fragmented. I think it is possible to end AIDS by 1990. And again, finally, just a real warm appreciation to Irish Aid for this forum. Thank you so much. Thanks. Or, or HIV being the, the leading cause of death amongst adolescents. That includes adolescent girls. We know that adolescent girls in sub-Saharan Africa are dying at an unacceptable rate because of lack of information, lack of services, aren't able to access sexual and reproductive health and right services on their own, always having to depend on parents or third-party authorization to access services. But we are also seeing through in initiatives, ironically, such as DREAMS, um, that there is more and more funding which is going to support the empowerment of adolescent girls and young women. Uh, the organization that I work for, the International HIV and AIDS Alliance, supports a, n a number of interventions around adolescent girls and young women, and a particular emphasis on adolescent girls living with HIV in a number of countries in Africa and sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think that we need to get better at articulating and defining the role of um, people who are most affected in defining the response for themselves. Um, we need young people to come and speak to politicians. We need adolescent girls to come to um, conferences um, and express what their needs are. We need young girls to be able to go to clinics and f feel confident and able to access or ask for services which they need, what they know they're going to receive in an um, in a open, enabling environment which isn't going to discriminate against them because of their age. Um, I think that's also slightly linked to the question about the self-testing. Um, I think our challenge is that far too many people do not know their HIV status. Um, but just as treatment literacy is equally important for antiretroviral treatment and PrEP, we need to ensure that there's sufficient literacy about self-testing. Um, and I think that once people understand the challenges around self-testing and are able to link to proper care, to proper support services, and to have a confirmation test after they have... Um, perform the self-test on themselves, it will be um, crucially important for us as educators, but also you as producers, um, to make sh sure that people understand self-testing in the context of a, of a broader response. And I don't think that we are there yet. Um, how we achieve 90-90-90, um, I think we need to 
I think we need to try and do anything and everything within a rights-based framework, which is going to ensure that more people know that their, their HIV status and of those people that they are able to access services in an enabling way, which is very much person-centered, but also importantly that those people understand the importance of staying on treatment and the importance of being undetectable for the rest of your life. Uh, what we are beginning to see in a number of countries is that people, we're seeing drug resistance to antiretroviral treatment, that people start coming off their treatment because they feel so much better. Um, and this is after at least 10, 15 years of antiretrovirals um, being introduced. My final comment before I hand over to Robbie is I'm just amazed that we aren't angry enough to say that HIV isn't over. Um, I cannot understand how politicians can glibly talk about the statistics and so many people don't know their HIV status and so many people still need treatment and so many people still need this, but we're changing focus and HIV is no longer a priority. And we cannot allow them to get away with that. We have to make sure that we get angry about HIV again. Um, yeah, so just more so in kind of the, in terms of the Irish context, um, and sexual, uh, yeah, sex ed in school in, Ar in Ireland. Well, personally, I had one, one sexual health class in Forster, a secondary school, and it was SPHE, and it was just reproductive health. Currently, the new mandatory things for LGBT inclusive, um, sexual health education is just that they put the anus on the diagram. That's it. Actually, the, the RSE, the Relationship Sex Education Guide out there, is actually quite good. It's quite, um, it's quite an okay one. But we go with the ethos of the school, and the guidelines at the very first page were like, you use from this what you deem necessary. So it's completely open to interpretation and to what individual people feel comfortable doing. What we done today, myself and Sean and Nadine, is we went to Donna Bate, and we talked to TY students, and we got to tell our stories of living with HIV. And we got to tell them that their voices aren't only just heard, but influential when they want to use them. We get them at a very young age. We got to tell them the, the realities of living with HIV. And what's very important with me and Sean and when we do our talk is this intergenerational dialogue. What's brilliant about it is we get to see what happened 30 years ago with HIV diagnosis. You get to see what it's like living with HIV in Ireland now for me. But also we get the young people to say what they can do now and what they can do in the future. I think that's so important to do. And if every school does what Donna Bate does, it would be a whole different society for people living with HIV. And we see differences in our um, HIV rates too. So that's school sex ed. Yes, we absolutely need to lobby for inclusive and mandatory sexual health education in school and LGBT inclusive as well, properly. In terms of the self-testing, I know let's get checked.ie. Um, I think if you're familiar with it, you can get your, uh, you can get it from a pharmacy, you go home, you get the test, but you send it off. And then they call you if, uh, or email you based on your results. So instantly, even if you do get a, a positive test, you're linked in with care. They're like, come in. And I think self-testing, if you're, if we're going to do it for the hard to reach people who want to remain anonymized, that will probably be the best, um, kind of framework for me. Because if you think about it, there's multidisciplinary teams within a sexual health clinic for a reason. We get people at the very beginning of their diagnosis, if the, if the medical worker and the sexual health advisor is there. We need this. So I, 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 I kind of have issues, to be honest, if someone can just go into a pharmacy, bring it home, get tested, and no wince need themselves. There are issues around that, and there's something that we need to discuss. Uh, as Sean says, unless you have a very clear understanding of what a result will mean for them. But yes, we do. If I just said earlier, Ireland has a notoriously bad way, um, a bad rate of going to get tested. And for many different reasons. So, so something like a, a self-testing package will actually be beneficial for the hard to reach populations, as we like to call them. And we do need to talk about that more and invest more and maybe subsidize the price a little bit. Um, but yeah, so uh, because if, if we want to get people, we're going to have to think about price as well. A lot of high-risk groups don't have the money. A lot can't afford to go to the GP, can't do it on campus, can't afford to take a whole day out of their life to go to St. James's Clinic. 
or don't have the time to go to Baggage Street and like, and that's only Dublin centric. So um, yes, to reach 1990-90, we need rapid testing. And the great thing about rapid testing as well, I, I'm going to butcher these statistics because I don't have the mummy, but they're available now. I think one third of the respondents, I think it was over 600 people, one third of them said that this is their first time getting tested for HIV. That's a phenomenal number. And I think 89% of them said they got tested just because they were in the same building. So we get them in. And we're, we're in gay bars at the weekends. Um, and on Tuesdays, we're even in the boiler house, which is a gay sauna. Um, the hard to reach people again. Uh, not too hard if you pay 17 quid in. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, <laughs> But yeah, well, and we need to increase this framework, not just for men who have sex with men, but for sex workers, for injecting drug use, get them in the methadone clinic, you know? We need to expand this rather than completely cutting funding. It's absolutely incredible. But yeah, if we want to get 1990-90, we can't just think of go to a clinic that tested. We need to think of all these resources we have. And self-testing is one, if let's get checked out. And I think that's a framework we should go by and push a little bit more. I have a friend who's a pharmacist, and this is completely empirical, so it could be wrong. But he said that he realized that there's an increase in people getting self-testing kits in his, in his pharmacy. So, you know, letting people know that they're out there is another option. I don't know, I think we need more data on it. Or I just need to research it better. Um, <laughs> and here's the global community, yes. And I was talking to Breed over here. And we are talking, there's absolutely necessary between local and international activism. One thing I saw about you used up AIDS was we were going around to all these students saying, this is what stigma does, this is what medication does, um, this is how you can help. But also, here's how you can help internationally. So we were doing so many different things at once. And by going to lobby to your TDs or MPs, we say you need to reprioritize HIV internationally, but they know it's important to reprioritize HIV domestically too. And we need to constantly, constantly put pressure on to reach the 1990-90. And we need to do it, as I say, in novel, in novel ways, and we need to do it quick. Really well done. Um, I want to raise the voice for um, the people who, until now, are not on treatment. I've known HIV, unfortunately, <laughs> since I worked on the HIV AIDS treatment unit in St. James's Hospital as a nurse there. When some people are old enough to remember Fab Vinny, our first DJ on Radio 2, who sadly died of disease from when there was no treatment. How many years later, nearly 30 years later, in, in 2016, it's brilliant that I wrote in a blog at the weekend, yeah. the glass is nearly half full, 18.2 million people globally are now on treatment. That's fantastic, mm -hmm. given where we were when we had no treatment. I want to raise a voice for the 18.5 million people who mm -hmm. still have to access treatment. I'm concerned, sick of me saying it, I'm talking about HIV, but I feel increasingly, and I want to challenge it. Is anybody here from UIAs tonight? Because I am going to write to them, I am going to speak to them. It is important that the 12 key populations are supported, reached, outed, informed, but I feel more than ever that the extreme poor disadvantaged, vulnerable people in poor areas of Mozambique, where I last visited, Ethiopia before mm. that, Uganda, Zambia. Many have never been tested, don't know their status. They're losing their lives and livelihoods. Meanwhile, we're supposedly investing in develop, development efforts for better livelihood outcomes. What can we do to reach people who don't have social media, don't have smartphones, Stigma is incredible. Many people go to traditional healers. How can we get adolescent girls and, sadly, I've worked, never seen extremely poor people at a conference in the number of times I've been at the International AIDS Conferences. Even if we could bring them in through video, or, mm. I mean, social media can do that these days. So what if, if the language is Makua, Shona, or Chitele? Surely the voices can be relayed back to us here in Ireland and in 2018 coming up at the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. It's great that more and more people are included, including mm -hmm. key populations, but the extreme poor and Irish aid is working with many of those communities in Central and Southern Africa. How can we get their voices 
heard and how can we get more of those people to be able to stay alive, get tested and get on treatment. Thanks. Nadine? Uh, thanks. Yeah, just a very, very small, um, two short things. Um, I had the, the privilege, my name is Nadine from the Irish Forum for Global Health. I had the privilege of seeing these guys speak twice today, not just once, but twice. And it was just incredible both times. Um, I was with them when they spoke to 135 transition year uh, students this morning. And watching their faces, these kids that really didn't know anything about HIV, nothing, really very, very little. And after the talk, for, for Robbie, after the talk, one of them insisted, said to the teacher, please can I ask him a question? Please can I? So she made it possible. And he had been talking about prep and he had been talking about all the peer work going on. And she said to him, I just have one question for you. If this works, why isn't it available? <laughs> and it was just so, um, mm. such a clear, clear question. And, and my second point is, um, Sean explained a story this morning of when he was first diagnosed, um, how he was dealing with his CD4 count and understanding HIV. And I wondered, would you uh, be willing to share that, that, that same story with everybody? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for asking that question. Um, about how can people can help. And I'd like that people here do want to help after this talk. Um, to create this network of young people that we need to do, we need to have structure and we need to have a place, uh, something in place for people to be able to come to and say, I want to help, how can I help? And we need this. We need a youth stop AIDS in Ireland. And we need to talk about HIV nationally and globally. And we need a constant, constant reminder. Because if you think about HIV campaigns, shag week is a week. You know, we need consistent one and young people to constantly use their social media and creativity. Um, that's on a local level and on a national level, international level. Funding needs to happen. I was currently, I, I, was, I have the full backing of various different um, NGOs in Ireland to help me with setting up a Ustop AIDS network in Ireland. And I went to uh, the HSC in Conlave for now. I was in the HSC for funding and they said, we have specific funding to the national um, sexual health strategy. And it goes towards four things. It goes towards surveillance, it goes towards um, communication, and two other things I don't know because I never heard them. Um, I just, yeah, whatever. And I was like, but this will work and it's needed because what I see nowadays, it, it's, it's just not working. Hey, rising HIV rates say that. We need a fresh approach and this model works. I've seen it myself. We need to invest in it. And my, the reply was, well, if we're giving money to all these great NGOs, why aren't they doing it? And I was like, that's a very good question. I was like, where do we get funding from when our own um, health strategy, uh, our own HSE, and not funding to it? So currently I'm looking for funding because I, my true passion is getting young people more involved in social issues. And I just think HIV is something that young people want to get involved in. And the thing about HIV is change is so tangible. You see it. You see it. From just young people talking about HIV, the stigma goes down. You know, imagine having that network consistently. And as I showed from you, it's undeniable how effective that will be. And I can say that, you know, I can say that very strongly. So if you want to help, come bring up your cards afterwards. We'll have a very nice discussion. I'm a very nice guy. Um, and we can work together. Because this will work and it needs to happen. So thanks, Eva, for that com um, comment. The next thing I want to say is um, people not in treatment. And as I said, I worked on um, access to medicines and I lobbied for it with uh, DFID and with uh, Westminster. And we know that there are other research and development models out there to make drugs affordable for everyone. But we need to put pressure on our governments to make this happen. And it might not happen in the next few years, but we need to constantly put pressure because they're changing the language slightly around the change in R&D models. It's actually the current research and development model isn't sustainable. And if we constantly put pressure on, we sub-Saharan Africa won't only have two options of medication. I know uh, South Africa is currently getting a third line of medication in there. How many people that would lives will that save? So in terms of getting people on treatment, constant pressure. I always find young people are like, oh, that's way too complex with me, you know, patent, compulsory licensing, pharmaceutical companies, all of this. But actually, I went in there with limited knowledge and a story, and I made waves. Young people aren't afraid to get the claws into complex issues, and that's what I'm really realized as well. Um, so yes, constant put pressure on pharmaceutical companies to make medicines affordable for all. 
like pediatric drugs for people living with HIV. We haven't made a new pediatric drug in years, and like children have to break them in half at mixed dosages because 95% of children born with HIV are in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's just not a profitable market. So we have to change that. We need medicines based upon global need rather than profit. And I really want to inspire people to really get involved in this because I really think we can make a difference in that. Um, so what can we do? Public pressure again. Uh, like, have to, like, I was never exposed to this issue. You're so in your own bubble in Ireland that I'm on my fourth option of medication, poor me. How amazing is it that I have my fourth option of medication? We need to expose people to the realities and expose them to the tools in which they can help. Um, so I hope that answers your question in terms of that. I wouldn't know much more in reducing stigma maybe in t- places outside of Ireland yet. Uh, I will expand my knowledge on that with these beautiful people. But, um, yeah, I, th- I think uh, Sean will definitely have a better idea. So, yeah, um, I think that's all the questions. Yeah. That's great. Um, just two very short comments. Um, I mean, I think uh, from a practical point of view, I, at the school this morning, I was really quite shocked that students did not know what HIV stood for or what AIDS stood for. And in 2016, and at first I thought um, when we opened for questions that they were being funny or really unable to ask um, serious questions, but they really don't know that HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. So the level of understanding about HIV in the country is incredibly low. So if you are able to talk to your family, your community, your church, invite people like Robbie to come and do presentations to your school, to your community, to your village, understand the arguments behind PrEP and why PrEP is so important, speak to your politician about why they aren't supporting PrEP. And there are very small things that people can do to get involved, but it begins with yourself. It begins with your commitment, and obviously you are committed because you are here this evening. And as for the CD4 thing, Nadine, I will never forgive you for this. (laughs) Um, It it was at a time before treatment was available, and one of the ways in which I tried to manage my HIV was I gave each of my CD4 cells a name. Um, and every morning I would sing to them. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to sing it to you, but I will try and remember their names. And their names were Aaron, Abel, Abelard, Basil, Bennett, Benjamin, Crosby, Cuthbert, Constantine, Damon, Darcy, Donald, Bain, Ernest, Edgar, Evelyn, Felix, Fergus, Fabian, Guthrie, Gavin, Gabriel, Harold, Hartley, Hadrian, Irvin, Isaac, Indigo, Jasper, James, Justinian, Kenneth, Kirby, Christopher, Leonard, Lawrence, Livingston, Manfred, Murray, Meredith, Oakley, Orville, Ormiston, Patrick, Proctor, Percival, Quince, Quinton, Quincy, Quillian, Richard, Ratcliffe, Reginald, Sandy, Seabrook, Socrates, Tarzan, Terence, Theodore, Yulchi, Uta, Ulysses, Vernon, Victor, Valentine, Winston, Woodrow, William, Xavier, Xerxes, Zena, Fon. <laughs> 